Hundreds of millions of years ago, our planet looked completely different. All the lands were united into one supercontinent, which eventually split into separate continents and lithospheric plates. They moved slowly across the globe. And 55 million years ago, the Indian plate, where India is now, collided with the Eurasian continent. The mightiest tremor created the highest mountains on the planet, the Himalayas. The western part enters the territory of modern Pakistan, and in the nearby mountain system, Karakorum is the second highest peak in the world, Chagari or Kitu, 8,611 meters. We are in the north of Pakistan in the mountainous region Gilgit Baltistan. Behind me is the fantastic Karakorum mountain system. It's one of the most mystical, mysterious and beautiful places on planet Earth. And under my feet is the place where the tectonic plates collided, thanks to which these mountains were formed. Imagine the movement of the plates continues today. They move 5 centimeters every year. This sometimes leads to earthquakes, an incredible natural phenomenon. Plate collision lines are considered places of extreme force. People here believe that supernatural phenomena and ancient mysteries rule people's lives. They say, at the junction of the plates from ancient times live the strongest shamans who are able to communicate with spirits and predict the future. The locals collect gold from mountain rivers, and the descendants of kings keep the secrets of longevity. We're going on an incredible mountain expedition to discover all the secrets of these places. We'll fly in search of golden rivers, try to discover the secrets of long-lived, and find the most powerful shamans on the planet. So let's fly! Now we'll see the Gilgit Baltistan from a bird's eye view. Flying over these places in a helicopter and seeing some of the most scenic sports in Pakistan from the air is an incredible opportunity. It will be just incredible. In these places that are associated with the mystical country of Shangri-La, which keeps the ancient secrets of mankind and the secrets of longevity. So many expeditions went to the mountains to try to find this paradise on Earth, where you can supposedly find the fountain of immortality. But all to no avail, it's our turn, friends, to try to find the mystical land of Shangri-La. They say it's around here somewhere. Perhaps we'll be lucky to unravel the mysteries of mankind, and if we meet incredible shamans, even predict the future. Who knows, maybe these are not just legends, perhaps there is at least some truth in them. It's no coincidence that it was the local shaman predicted the appearance of airplanes and cars, calling them iron horses and flying cars back in the 18th century. All came true. I wonder what the future holds for us. I really hope that this expedition will provide answers to very important questions for all mankind. We are in Kashmir. This is a unique region. Look how it's beautiful. I just can't believe my eyes. Now we're heading through the Hunza River Valley towards the capital of the former Hunza Kingdom. And let's see how the rules lived in these places when it was not Pakistan, but the land of kings. World Inside Out with Metro Kalmaro, Pakistan. Not far from the so-called mountain meeting point, the three largest mountain systems converge. The Himalayas, the Hindu Kush, and the Karakorum is a place that many mountain admirers call paradise on Earth. The mysterious valley of Hunza River is the home for the amazing Hunza Kuta people. They say these people live for 120 years and hardly get sick. According to one version, 
Their tiny state was founded by the army of General Alexander the Great. From ancient times, the Hunza Kurds lived in independent principalities governed by mirs or simply kings. Even after the Hunza became part of Pakistan, they retained partial power. And only 47 years ago, they completely lost power and from the royal dynasty turned into ordinary people. But reminders of the monarchy times can be found everywhere. There are two which are the most important, the ancient forts of Altit and Baltit, where the local kings lived and from where they ruled. The descendants of the kings still live here in the Hunza Valley. We'll be sure to meet them, but first let's get to the real royal palace. The Altit stands on the very edge of the precipice, resembling the harsh castles of Game of Thrones. It seems the guards are about to climb the walls of the fort to go the inhabitants of the valley. It's 1,100 years old, and it has a unique history. You know, in the kingdoms and in any government in general, there is always a struggle and a war for power. And here such battles raged. The most famous of them when two royal sons quarreled. And one of them, the eldest, moved to Fort Baltit. And the younger one stayed here in Altit. And he began to organize a war against his elder brother. But the elder brother eventually won, and the younger one was walled up here, in one of the columns of this fort. Then they punished like that. You can also pay attention to one very interesting feature. These wooden layers, such wooden shock absorbers, I would call them so, between the stone parts of the wall, it's done so that this building can withstand an earthquake of any magnitude. And there was an eight and a half magnitude earthquake in Pakistan, and the fort survived, despite it's over a thousand years old. Let's go inside and arrange a short tour. It's very interesting to look at the interior of the ancient fort and imagine how the kings lived. And they lived, by the way, very modestly. Squeaking doors, beams, medieval interior. The palaces of the local kings are not Versailles. Instead of golden marble, wood and clay mixed with manure. And instead of spacious halls, small rooms with tiny doors. You won't believe where we are, but this is the king's room. Here is his makeshift bed. A blanket and some carpets were laid here, so by our standards, there isn't even the smell of luxury in this kingdom. All of this has remained almost unchanged until present time. The funniest thing, friends, let's see the royal toilet. It's something. The king goes to the toilet and he sees such a fantastic landscape. You look down and it's just scary to watch because the abyss is endless. But it's not a balcony, it's not a terrace, it's a toilet. And through that hole, the royal family answered the call of nature. And all the products of human life that fell into this hole flowed right there down. And fell into the river. It was a royal sewer bad man. Honestly, if I were the king, I wouldn't set up a toilet here. I'd set up a super terrace in order to relax and enjoy my life. And he made a toilet here. What can I say? Kings can do anything. The carvings are the most luxurious details in the royal forts here in the Hunza Valley because the atmosphere is very modest. But there are interesting details. Look. We see a swastika. 
In a fort in a Muslim country, the question is, how did it get here? The fact is that it's the one of the symbols of Buddhism and Hinduism, and before the advent of Islam, there was Buddhism here. The legendary Silk Road passed through the Hunza Valley. Many Buddhist missionaries and monks found refuge here. As a result, the most of the locals began to practice Buddhism. And this region has played an important role in its spread throughout Asia. Islam came to these lands later, in the 15th century. Here it is. It sounds creepy, but in front of us is the same column in which a man is walled up. And there is confirmation of this. Bones were found there. Then there was the restoration, and the skeleton still remains there. The laws were so harsh back then. For any crime, the rulers punished quickly and severely, both a plebeian and a nobleman. And for the latter, the convictions were much harsher, although it's hard to believe nowadays. It was believed that plebeian would not be able to do much harm, so they were simply imprisoned. But the man of nobility can turn the crowd against their ruler, because such people are listened to. Therefore, for disobeying the authorities, the nobles could easily be sentenced to death. But even hanging wasn't the most terrible punishment compared to the execution that awaited those who dared to attack the royal fort. It's very scary. Get ready for unique shots. Here it is. Place of execution. The sentries took the one who tried to take the fortress, captured him, brought him to this point, and from that very place, they simply threw him into the abyss. And that's it. The man crashed. It makes me shiver. It's so scary. A fierce struggle for power raged within these walls more than 800 years ago. Now in the warm season, you can meet tourists here and always afford caretaker. He'll help to shed light on the features not only of his fortress, but of the entire region. This fort is located in a place that is protected by nature itself. It's surrounded by mountains and abysses. It was hard to get here. The mountains protect the fortress, but we heard a lot about shamans and mysticism. How do you feel about it? There are both shamanism and mysticism in our history. I must admit that many of the shaman's prophecies have come true. For example, the construction of the Karakorum Highway, which is called the Eighth Wonder of the World. And what about more global predictions? In 1860, part of a large mountain collapsed. Then a shaman named Bulbul Pir predicted that in 150 years there would be the same landslide, but on the other side of the mountain. Several of the strongest shamans of Hunza at once made the same terrible prediction in different years. It was about a mountain that must split and fall to create an incredible lake just in the valley. But the price for this will be human lives. This prophecy came true relatively recently. Now we're going to the most tragic place from the prophecies of local shamans. But first, we have to overcome the path through the mountains. My friends, we're driving on the legendary Karakorum Highway. It's really a building wonder of the world. Luxury's highway, 1,300 kilometers, which crosses the mountain range and altitudes up to 4,700 meters. I would even say that after the construction of the Great Wall of China, this is the second most huge construction in human history. At such heights, roads are usually non built in principle. 4,700 meters. This is, for example, slightly lower than the base at Everest. Imagine a road of such quality just there. Or it's two Ukrainian Hoverlos, which put one on top of the other, and almost half of Hoverlo has to be placed on top of them. 
Karakorum Highway was built for 20 years. Due to the terrain, the need for explosions, constant landslides and rock falls, many people died during the construction. Tens of billions of dollars were spent. When you hear such numbers, the question should immediately arise, and who benefits from it? This is beneficial to China. So the Chinese built this road, and they founded this project. In ancient times, the legendary Silk Road passed there, and caravans transported goods. Today it's also a kind of Silk Road, which is not yet complete. The Karakorum Highway connects the Chinese border with the Pakistani capital Islamabad. China and Pakistan will soon complete the joint construction of a grand project. Fort Gwadar near the border with Iran, and the road to it from Islamabad. Then the Karakorum Highway will allow China to deliver its goods to Arab countries in Africa much faster and cheaper. Now ships have to take a big detour around the mainland. But when the project is completed, Chinese trucks will be able to cut most of the way through Pakistan straight to the Arabian Sea. And for ordinary travelers, this road is an incredible open-air museum. The Karakorum Highway is the only place in the world where you can see the majestic giant 8000 Ananda Parbat, one of the three most dangerous in the world for climbers, right from the car window. According to statistics, every third of false climber who tries to climb to the top of Nanga Parbat to the height of 8,126 meters unfortunately dies. Oh, this strength and power is very impressive. It's unbelievable that at arm's length we see this mountain. We've been walking for two weeks to see Everest. Here you just go on the highway and here it is. By the picturesque highway of the modern Silk Road, we're approaching the place of shamanic predictions. We're approaching the tunnel, and before entering the tunnel, the inscription says, Friendship of Pakistan and China. Joint project. And we do not go to the tunnel like all cars, but turn left. Quite a steep road, but that's exactly how it went 10 years ago. All cars drove here. My lord, what stones are lying around, look at them. All these stones fell from above, look at them. So it's dangerous to drive here, any moment a stone may hit you. Previously, this broken road was the same Karakorum Highway, until it was covered by a huge landslide. Here the life of Karakorum Highway was interrupted. It was covered in a landslide. You see the pole, power line, and it goes there further to the rubble. And this is a mysterious lake that was predicted by several shamans on the region. But the very story of this miracle of nature is horrifying. Only 10 years ago, there was none of this. There were houses, people lived here, there was a road, cars drove. When you look at it, it seems to be a lake that was formed millions of years ago. But not at all. On the 4th of January 2010, as shamans had predicted, a huge piece of rock broke off and crashed into the valley, stopping the Honza River. Here comes the gorge. A mountain river flowed alone eight, ten years ago, but there was a collapse. We can clearly see the light part of the rock. This section is so flat that it resembles a ski slope from a fire. But imagine that before there was part of a huge rock, a piece of rock 800 meters wide and over a kilometer high simply broke off and collapsed. That day, people heard a terrible roar and a huge mass of rock fell off on the right side. And then the stones flew from the left. The rock collapsed and the most terrible shaman's prophecy came true. It said that when a lake was born, people would die. Almost at the top of the mountain, you can see the houses. This is the outskirts of the village of Upper Attabad, and most of the houses were on the part of the rock that broke off. 
We see they survived houses at the top and piles of stones below. Unfortunately, under these stones are also houses, or rather, they remained, and 19 people died there. Those who saw that disaster describe the terrible day as Amagadon. We heard an explosion, and the ground beneath our feet shook. I remember shouting that Atabad was falling down. The old people scolded me for saying such things. Our relatives and friends were there, but then they realized I was telling the truth. Everything was in the dust. People were shouting around. It was like the end of the world. It seemed that I had died and entered another world. Then very large stones began to fall, like the one I'm on right now, and even bigger ones. If you look close, you can see the remains of some houses. Before the collapse, there was a solid mountain on which the village of Attabad was located. Oh, look, friends, there is a certain relief in color. The rock is dark and very relief. And then we see a smooth slope, like a ski slope. And then we can see the rocks again. After the tragic day, this bright spot formed which we see. This is the place where the rock collapsed. This is Akimja, one of the inhabitants of the village of Attabat who survived a terrible disaster. We're approaching the epicenter of the collapse. I can see the remains of a building. What is it? This is the territory of the village of Attabat. There was a house, and here, where we stand now, there were also houses. Did they all go down? Yes, everything fell down. I know it hurts to think about, but tell about the terrible day. It all started at night. More stones fell from the mountain than ever before, and we realized that there would be something wrong. Therefore, many began to gather and go to relatives. Everyone was sure that it's dangerous only in our village because it's located on the mountain. So we went down to the valley. We thought that the stone fall would not get there. I have to say that rock falls often here. Everyone is used to it, but no one could have imagined that a whole piece of the mountain would fall off. This happens very rarely. Our house was in the valley, a little away from the mountain, so all the relatives, Farm and Arsalan with their families, came to hide with us, but in the end our village was covered with a landslide. The whole house was covered with stones and soil. So you were basically trapped. Right. We don't remember much because we fainted almost immediately. We were pulled out only a few hours later. Almost the whole family was in the house. Grandfather, grandmother, mother, brother and sisters. But only two of us survived. Everyone in this house died. Yes. How many people were there? Eleven with them. We drank tea, talked about life, and then we heard people shouting outside and stones falling. I remember my brother holding my hand and my sister in my arms. He was ten years old and our sister was three. Then came the shock and I passed out. What a nightmare. And how did he survive? It was a miracle. When I saw what was left of the house, I couldn't believe that the children could stay alive there. The walls collapsed and the roof fell a little at an angle. Thus, there was very little space left in the room, which was not covered with stones. That is where the boys were during the landslide. I haven't asked many questions in front of the boys because I understand how it can hurt them. And I haven't asked them to go to the place where it all happened. But I'll ask you, if you have strength and patience to drive to this place again, let's go together and see what's left of the house. Okay. We are now driving on the old Karakorov Highway, which was here before the construction of the modern, where the tunnel is. 
and in fact, the collapse blocked this road completely. When this road was the main one, it was much better. Tell me, but the highway is very strategically important, I would say. When the collapse occurred and the road was blocked, how was the transport issue solved? Locals transported people and cars across the lake in large boats. There was no other way. Locals turned their boats into modern barges, and they transported not only people and provisions, but even transit cars or truckers who traveled between Pakistan and China. Such earnings became the salvation of many locals. Those farms and fields were destroyed by the collapse. This lasted for five years until the broken Karakorum Highway was connected by a new tunnel. The closer we are to the remains of the village, the more often the trip turns into a ride on the edge. My friends, it's extreme. Just on the edge. We don't want to fall over. Such a wooden bridge is stunning terrain, really. Very beautiful, but it's very difficult for life. We're going on such an extreme road, making our way to the place where all the stones fell. The road, of course, is scary, just incredibly. When pebbles move, it's very scary. Look down. That's it, you won't go any further, we have to go on foot. We arrived to the village where the inhabitants of Upper Atabad fled along mountain paths to escape the rockfall. This place we're walking through, was there anything here? It's our village. There were houses there. And there you see a big pile of stones. There was a school. Where the river is now, there were also houses. Such gardens were everywhere. Me and my relatives lived in this village. There were also houses above. Nine people died there. Thus, the place where people wanted to save their lives became their grave. The saddest thing is, we are already at a place where there were houses, where people died. Everything was washed away by the mudslide. Pieces of rock and soil mixed with water and flooded the valley. Here you can even see that it's clay mixed with water. Pieces of rock and stones. Such a mess simply flowed from here and demolished everything in its path. We're approaching the place where you can see the wall of the house that collapsed. Obviously, judging by the beams, it's a roof. And most likely, people also died here. Here was the house where Arsalan and Faim were found. There is a big room here and they were sitting in this corner. So Faim and Arsalan were sitting in this corner, which is why they survived. Further you can see the clay, so further changes were less and less. After the disaster, the whole valley was covered with earth and stones to the level we stand now. There was flat ground on which we walked straight to the other side. It's just terrible to imagine. All this was covered with stones and mud, clay, to the opposite side, so you could walk. And there was no river here. It was all clay and stones. Later, the river laid a new course. You arrived here an hour after the tragedy. What did you see here? There were thousands of people here. Rescues, volunteers, military, locals. Everyone was looking for survivors. We searched, but found only the dead. I personally found the bodies of four of my relatives here. 
my younger brother Arsalan, my younger sister, cousin, and aunt. This tragedy is called the most mysteries of the history of the Hunza Valley. 150 years ago, a shaman prophesied about it. It's hard to believe, but on the eve of the disaster, there was another warning. Specialists came a few weeks before the disaster and said that we had no more than 15 days before the collapse. But not everyone listened to them. We didn't take this warning seriously. The stones are constantly falling from the mountain here. People can be wrong and we were ever wrong. We thought the collapse would go straight and it went aside down the river. It covered my house. My two daughters died there. These people spent their lives at the junction of tectonic plates. Small earthquakes and rock falls for them, as for us, for example, thunderstorms, are commonplace. Therefore, not everyone took their warning seriously. Today, Lake Atabad reminds of the disaster, which was named after the village of Atabad. Today, this lake is the main attraction of this part of Pakistan. But 10 years ago, this lake became the main danger of the whole valley. In order to see this clearly, it's best to get up in the air and look at this place from a helicopter. You see the lake and then the stream. This is exactly the place of the collapse. Stones, mud and earth fell on both sides. All these demolished houses on its way. In fact, the mountain fell and formed a dam two kilometers wide, which blocked the river. Thus, the lake was filling with water faster and faster, and daily depth increased by one meter. And in a few months, the lake became a hundred meters deep. Every day, the water took away more and more houses, farms, schools and hospitals. People were left homeless, and the danger only grew. It's not a dam which was built according to the exact calculations of engineers. It's just an embankment of earth and stones that have fallen chaotically, on which more and more water was pressed every day. Huge mess. The destruction of this dam would instantly entail a huge wave and mud flow, which demolishes everything on its path. Emergency response workers with the help of machines tried to drill a hole in order to get water from the lake and not flood human settlements, but manpower was not enough to cope with the power of nature. And after three months of work in extremely difficult mountainous conditions, the workers and rescue teams managed to break a channel through the dam to release water. But this was not enough, because more water came down the river that went through the channel. Its level in the lake continued to rise. Eventually, the lake became 21 kilometers long. Only six months after the collapse, the water level in Lake Atabat was stabilized and the danger receded. It sounds mystical, but Finally, the problem was not solved by man, but by nature itself. We you know water sharpens a stone, and the water still cut a stream and made its way and created a new stream bed. Thus, it shifted a hundred meters and now runs there. And nature has proved once again it's more powerful than humanity. And if it is decided from above that there should be a lake here, it will be here, and the process cannot be stopped. The lands of the slopes of the largest mountain systems, the Himalayas, Karakarum and Hindukush, are often called the peaks of the world, paradises and magical valleys, but unfortunately, the reality here is not always happy. Given that tectonic plates collide here, the zone is seismically active. I think we need to realize that in any moment, in any region like this, such things can happen. No highland settlement is insured against this. You're right, but it's our land. We love the mountains, so we're not afraid. After I was drowning in Brazil, I was afraid to dive for a meter. Here I am diving, and it seems to me that I am drowning again. Aren't you afraid of the mountains? 
No, we are not afraid of the mountains. If I ever have a chance, I would like to come back here and build my house here. How do you live today? What do you do now? It was really hard at first. We had no home. I had to go to the city, but there was no place to live. But our family made it. Thanks to moving to the city, we were able to study good schools. I study at the army college, 11th grade. I study in the 9th grade in a regular school, but I'll go to the army after that. The first days were the most difficult. Allah helped me to get back on my feet. I used to think there was no life for me down there, only on the mountain. But when we got to the towns in the valley, it turned out that it was not so bad. Few people in our village studied more than 10 grades, and there people had a chance to get an education. This is a very important change. I entered the university and got a degree in social psychology. We lost everything we had, but we did not give up. We worked and now we live normally. I had my hotel here, it was ruined too, but over time I managed to build a new one. After all, it changed our land and our lives. People from different countries come here. The government helps to develop tourism. All this is good for locals. The collapse of the rock, the destruction of the village of Attabad, and the formation of the lake, a tragedy, the loss of human lives. But this is a new life for the whole region. Because after the lake was created 10 years ago, Hunza has become the largest tourist region in Pakistan. Almost every tourist who comes to this country comes here to see this lake, take pictures, take a tour on a board. However, in summer, when it's warm, it's too cold now, Lake Atabad is now the most important tourist attraction. In such places you understand how unpredictable nature can be. But at the same time, it always maintains balance. And if something is taken away, something is given in return. Atabad has become one of the main values of this part of Pakistan. But it's not the only treasure of the Hansa Valley. We return to the city of Karimabad, the residence of former kings, where real treasures can still be seen, and most importantly, to find the members of a royal family. We arrived at the incredible fortress. It's called Baltit. It's 800 years old. Till the 45th year in the last century, the rulers of Hunza lived here. Perfectly preserved. It's a pure history. However, when Pakistan became independent, the kings ceased to be rulers and the fort was turned into a museum. And here's its guardian. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. My name is Dmitro. What's your name, please? Salahuddin. I've been a caretaker of this fort for 24 years. Tell me about this place and the people who live here. Mir Muhammad Jamal Khan lived here. In 1945, he moved to the new palace. And this one stood empty till 1990. Come with me, I'll show you everything. We're going to the ancient fort of the Mirs, the kings of the Hunza Valley, which was built 800 years ago. There are no crowds of tourists. This is impressive. It's very dark here. Wooden stairs. Like the Fort Altid, the fortress of Baltit hardly resembles a luxurious royal residence. But it's not a mistake of ancient designers, but a strategic decision. This building is designed not only for a luxurious life, but also for military conditions. The ground floor is completely occupied by storage rooms for everything you need in case of a siege. It was here that the prince lived, who won the war with his brother and walled him up in a column of the old fort. So beautiful. This is the living room of the king. Imagine that the king opened the window in the morning, went out and admired his lands, his kingdom. Everything has remained virtually unchanged in terms of nature. You can see the same valley, the same mountains as in royal times, the same river Hunza. Only the kings are gone. This is now the territory of Pakistan, and here you can literally touch history. And here was the stove, right? 
He was the king's banker. A bank? Is this a safe? A depository of money? Yes. And what's that? If the king needed money, he got it from there. Fantastic. It is a bank. It's an, an ancient royal safe. There was no paper money in those days. There were coins by order of the king. There was always a treasurer who gave money. The king simply held out his hand, and the treasurer gave him the required amount. Imagine a wife asking the king, where is the money? He knocked, the door opened, a bag of gold. Here, go to the market. May I enter the bank? Sure, but it's been renovated right now. Let's see how the bank closed. The lock is the same as in our village houses. We open it and get to the bank. Cool. This room was full of gold, which flowed to the king from all corners of his principality. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Mitro. Mushara. Mushara. He'll die. You're carrying out restoration work here. There was a storehouse of gold. Where are you lucky to find anything precious? For half a century, from 1935 to 1990, this place was abandoned and fell into disrepair. There are no treasures left here. If I were you and found gold, I wouldn't tell anyone to. I would say nothing. Well, thanks. I still wish you to find a gold coin and don't tell anyone. And there's still a lot of gold friends in these places. This a gold-bearing valley. In addition to local taxes, the treasury of this fort was also filled due to its very convenient location. The local military garrison controlled trade flows through the Karakarum between South and Central Asia. The evidence is hanging on the walls. This is Chinese money. And why Chinese? In ancient times, trade between the countries was very active here. Even then, the Pakistani, or rather, the Mir kings, were doing business with China. Very cool, I like it. And what do we have here? It's a bedroom and a kitchen in the same time. Are all these items from that time? It is some kind of imitation, fake. It's all real. We still use such pots on the farms, and they're made of stone. By the way, I can see the obvious difference between stone dishes and metal dishes. The metal one is just leaky, because time does not spare steel. And the stoneware is still intact. And if you don't break it, it will last another thousand years, right? Yes, these dishes are very durable. Such ancient dishes are not just a memory of times gone by, it's still used here. Some researchers believe that this method of cooking is one of the main secrets of longevity of Hunzikerts. We will definitely check it out and find out what is the charm of local cuisine. This is a unique dish. It was made with the help of marmor horns. This is a halical goat. It has strong horns, doesn't it? This legendary Pakistani goat. Yes, they are hard as iron. The horns of this goat have a feature. The more circles are of them, the older an animal is. I have the same story with the moustache. Their total length on both sides is now 90 centimeters. Fantastic! And I couldn't get what do you have? Such sidewards. The moustache is wrapped around the ears. Fantastic! How many years have you grown? 24 years. 24? Haven't cut once? Recently I cut off 10 centimeters to trim. They grew unevenly. May I touch it? I'm sorry. Yes, of course. What a moustache! Exceptional! You have to be in the record book. You won't see such a moustache anywhere. Many history books tell about me, and tourists always take photos with me. And this is the first king, Kazan Khan I. His moustache resembles yours. Yes, he's very similar to me, but each of the kings had his own style. And here in this room we see the portraits of all the kings of different years. Yes. When the independent Pakistan was formed and the kingdoms of the Hunza officially ceased to exist, they remained formally, and yet the royal power was passed down from generation to generation. Are there many descendants of kings in this city? Yes, the descendants of kings are still alive.
in this area, princes and kings are not ancient history. The reign of monarchs ended only 47 years ago. That's why royal families still live here in the valley, and we'll try to find them out. The world inside out. In the next episode, a royal way of life, how the rulers of Hunza Valley filled their treasuries. Gold had to be given to the king, everyone had to give 20 or 30 grams. And how do members of the royal family live now? I would have many possessions and a palace, definitely not such a small guest house and a simple restaurant as now. We'll find out whether is it possible to get fabulously rich in this region in seconds. Land, house and a plane? And we'll try to find out treasure where the mountains shower people with jewelry. Gold appears out of nowhere, out of the sand. This land is unique. This coast is golden. The World Inside Out with Metro Komarov.